everyone, this is Emily from The Female Abroad, and you are listening to the Incurable Wonderlusts podcast, which offers tips, tricks, and trips to help make you a more confident and knowledgeable traveler. Here we provide and discuss firsthand knowledge from our trips to make sure your trip planning is easier. Be sure to follow so you can find this podcast when you really need it and visit thefemaleabroad.com for podcast transcripts, our social media links, and more information that can help you with all your travel planning. Traveling with your four-legged animal is something that is starting to get easier as more people start to treat their dogs like family and not just pets. Just like traveling with actual children, however, if you're planning to travel with your pet, some planning needs to come into play. Now, in this episode, I'm not talking about ESAs or support dogs, but your family pet. As a dog owner myself, I have found that dogs will either stay with their friends, family, are kenneled, or if you're like us, then we'll try and plan a trip with them in mind. For example, our last trip was a quick getaway to a local town just a couple hours away for an evening. Since the trip was super short and last minute, kenneling or leaving with friends or family was not an option. So before we got on the road, we had to do some quick research into items such as, are there any dog-friendly hotels? What are the pet fees, if any? What regulations does the hotel have for pets? Example, they have to be under a certain size. It's only a room on a specific floor. Do they provide any amenities like a water bowl? Usually we have to call the hotels to ask because if you make a reservation on a third-party site like Expedia, there is a spot for you to request approval for the animal. But if the hotel does not have space, then they may accept your reservation but cancel the fact that you cannot bring your dog, leaving you stuck. If you do find that you have a really great rate on a third-party site, however, call the hotel and see if there's any chances of them being able to assign you to a dog-friendly room. If they can, see if they can match the rate that you found online and also check what the pet policy is as well as any fees. If they are unable to match the price, which is not a surprise as many enter into contracts saying that they cannot, then let them know that you are going to book the room through the site and that there will be a note about you needing a dog-friendly room. If your trip is not for a bit, then a week before your arrival, I would email the hotel with a reservation to remind them that you are coming with your dog just in case they missed the note or they forgot about it. If you do this a week out, then this will give the hotel a better idea about occupancy as well as time to shuffle things around because they forgot about your note. You should also ask the hotel where they can let your dog use the restroom in case you're someplace where it's your hotel and nothing else. You will also need to be able to keep your dog as quiet as possible while you are in the hotel. Also keep in mind that pets designated rooms have had multiple pets in them without a deep cleaning in between. So your dog will pick up on all of these smells and may be skittish, unsure, and timid. If you do not travel with a crate like us, then setting up the closet for his own little home is a great way to make them feel safe because then they are in an enclosed area where no one can sneak up on them. You need to also look into other things like are dogs allowed on restaurant patios? Certain cities in our area allow it. Other cities will allow dogs only on the patios if you can access them from outside. Other cities will let you walk your dog through a business to get to the patio while others will not even allow them on the patio due to health and safety regulations. A lot of places, this varies city to city and is not the same throughout the entire country. Now, are there dog regulations for the city? We've been to cities where dogs are not allowed in every park or they're not allowed on city-owned grass unless there are signs stating that the dog is allowed to walk there. So some cities are very strict compared to others. Other things to look at are, are there any off-leash dog parks in the area? Are there any pet stores? What about dog-friendly hikes or walks? What about dog-friendly stores? For example, some shops in the Lower Mainland around here will allow dogs inside as long as they do not prepare food on the premise. Are there pet sitting surfaces? What are their ratings, costs? How do you book them? What information do they require? Is there a booking timeline? For example, you need to book 24 hours before the pet sitting time. If there is anything specific that we want to do, then we'll also look to see if the activity is dog-friendly. For example, googling dog-friendly wineries or breweries. Once we know this information, then we can properly plan our trip based around our four-legged fur child. 
When packing, we always make sure to bring the following items, copies of his vaccination records and a recent photo, a large Ziploc with his food, his food and water bowl. If it is summer and we're going somewhere hot, we actually have a water bowl that keeps his water cold for up to 45 minutes. So we'll stick with that. A bottle of water, a towel for drying or wiping, an extra roll of poop bags, his bed, a blanket or sleeping bag, a toy, treats that he normally gets. For example, our pooch gets a greenie every morning a toy, and then obvious items like leash, collar, and poop bags. Now make sure the collar has the dog's ID tag with his name or her name, as well as your contact information, and also the rabies ID tag. Now, after listing this, I really feel like our pup is a little spoiled, or maybe I just travel enough that I know what to pack for him. Either way, it's a lot. <laughs> Besides packing things for him, I will also make sure his vaccinations are up to date, find the location and phone number for the nearest 24-hour vet or emergency hospital, and while my pooch is crate trained, we do not travel with one, so as we have not needed to do so, but some hotels and vacation rentals ask that your dog is kept in a crate or put into one when you are not there. If you do need to bring a crate, then make sure it is large enough for the dog to stand turn and lie down, but not too big as they may use the back area as a bathroom. It also needs to be able to have ventilation, a leak proof bottom with a comfortable mat, strong sturdy sides because if you leave them in a soft crate they are probably going to get out. You have to make sure it also has a water bottle and it helps if you put your dog's favorite toy or treat into it. The outside should also have a sticker that says live animal with your contact name, address, and phone number. Now, when it comes to actually traveling with your dog, if you're going to go, usually you'll go via plane or car. So you can take a cruise ship, but they usually will only allow a couple dogs on board, which are kept crated in the lower decks where staff will walk them a couple times per day. If you are going to cruise, check with the cruise line before planning to bring your dog. Now, if you're traveling by car, then try to get your dog used to being in a car by taking some short rides around the area leading up to the trip. If they will be crated during the drive, then make sure that the crate is used for these short trips as well and that the crate is well ventilated with fresh airflow. Another option for a drive is to have a dog car seat, which I have no idea what that is, but if you can buy it for a human, you can buy it for a dog. Uh, you could get a dog seat belt or you could get something that I like to call a zip line. Now the zip line was a seat belt type that went around the back of the seats. Then there was a harness that connected to another piece of seat belt that we'd fed through the seat belt that was wrapped around the back seats. He could then move anywhere in the back that he wanted to go, but he couldn't come up front as it wasn't long enough, nor stick his head out the window. When trip time, time comes, make sure that you allow for lots of walks and potty breaks as they like to stretch their legs just as much as we do and just like kids, they can get bored while driving. If you're going to fly, then you'll want to check with your carrier, the airline that you're flying with, as to what they do to allow dogs, what rules they have about traveling with the animal, and if there's any costs associated. For example, Air Canada no longer allows animals to travel in the luggage compartment and they have to travel via cargo because it's too difficult to regulate the temperature in the baggage hold on most of their planes. In the USA, if the dog will be exposed to temperatures below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, 7 degrees Celsius, or above 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 29 degrees Celsius, for more than four hours during the trip, regardless of if it's in flight or a connection, then the dog has to be shipped as excess baggage or cargo. So you will want to check your locations to see what the average temperatures are of your departure, arrival, and connecting locations to make sure your dog will be fine. You might also want to check times of day as well, as hot or summer locations will be cooler in the early morning or late evenings, whereas wintry or cold locations would be best to fly midday, so this could also affect your travel times. Now, as a general rule of thumb, airlines will want a copy of your dog's certification of health and rabies certificate from your vet provided to them no earlier or later than 10 days before you travel. You'll also want to speak to your vet about if your dog should be tranquilized for the trip, and if so, how to go about it. 
It is not necessary to sedate your dog to travel, but if yours is like mine and screams, then you'll want to sedate them for their own sake so they don't hurt themselves. You are also responsible for your dog's health and ability to fly. So if your dog is not healthy enough and something happens to them, the airline is not considered at fault. Also make sure to buy and pack the medications or flea preventatives that you might need while on the trip. Your dog should also not be any younger than eight weeks old. And if you're traveling with the airline, then you will need a kennel that is hard-sided, non-collapsible if they're going in cargo. If you're bringing your dog on the plane, then a soft-sided collapsible kennel that fits underneath the seat in front of you will be required. If you have a short-muzzled breed like a Frenchie or Pug, then bringing them into the passenger section of the plane is a must because they are very susceptible to respiratory issues if the humidity or temperature increases. As soon as you throw in stress, anxiety, and confinement into that mix, the risk increases even more. It is because of this that most airlines actually will not allow these breeds to fly in cargo. However, if you are allowed to bring your dog on board, the carrier that they travel in counts towards your carry-on luggage allowance, so do make note of that. You should also not feed your dog six hours before the trip, but make sure they have lots of water. If your dog is aggressive or disruptive, they will be refused travel no matter if it's going in cargo or in the passenger section. Now, if you are traveling with your dog, it is best that you call the airline to make the booking because the dog needs to have their ticket booked at the same time. The reason for this is because airlines only allow a specific number of animals per flight. So if you book your ticket online and then call the airline to book the doggo, they may have too many animals already on that flight. Now, some airlines do allow you to cancel your ticket for free within 24 hours of the booking, even if it's a non-refundable fare. So if your airline does allow this, you could risk booking the flight, then calling the airline. Also, if you can, book a direct flight as this will prevent unnecessary stress for puppers. It also prevents the risk of the airline's rules changing while traveling if you end up having to code share with a partner airline. When you are on the phone with the airline, make sure to check the crate dimensions that they require because if you do not meet them, the dog won't be traveling. Besides just making sure that you have the flight all figured out, you'll also need to check the destination. Things like, will the dog need to be quarantined? If so, for how long? What vaccinations do they need? Which vaccination records or health certificates do you need? What is required to arrive and leave the country? Also check any regulations in the country that you leave, pass through, or arrive in. Also ask if it's a code share flight, because if that is, then that means you're flying on a plane operated by a partner airline. So you'll want to contact that airline directly to check their requirements. Now, if you're planning on traveling via train or bus, you will need to check with the company that you want to travel with because some have strict restrictions as to what size of animal can travel and some won't let anything but a service dog travel. Now, are you someone that travels with your furry friend often? Are there tips and tricks that we may have missed? Depending on which platform you're listening to, leave us a comment below and let us know. Now, make sure to tune in over the coming weeks as I will be interviewing a few people about their trips, such as a backpacking honeymoon in Japan, catching COVID while traveling in South America, and many more. Exciting times for sure! Now, if you are someone that would love to be interviewed for our show, I will leave our Facebook group information in this episode's description so you can join. And when we're looking for our next round of interviewees, you might be one of the lucky few. Safe travels! Thank you for listening and make sure to follow or subscribe so you never miss an episode and can find us when you need to plan your next trip. If you can, recommend The Incurable Wonderlust to those that you travel with, and also, if you have a moment, leave us a rating and a review. In the review, if there are topics or destinations that you'd like to learn more about, make sure to include it in your comment. Also, do not forget to visit thefemaleabroad.com for more helpful tips, tricks, and trips, as well as podcast transcripts, and if you want to stay up to date with me, then follow me on Instagram at female underscore abroad. 
Remember, The Incurable Wonderlust is a weekly podcast with new episodes released every Thursday. Thanks again for listening, and until next week, safe travels! Bye!